Okay. What do I got to do here? <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, well, Mike, for being with us. Both of them are there. Okay. Yeah. Is, uh, is Kevin you. there? Kevin here is also? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Right. This is really, uh, this is really great. We're going to try to keep this to uh, the limited time we have, but we'll try to keep it a general conversation. I'm Mark Thompson. I'm going to try to moderate as best I can, but I'll have a lot of help from those who are... Uh, with the uh, Democrats for the Protection of Animals and all the other organizations that have been so generous in trying to put this together and have actually uh, gotten it together. It's quite impressive. So LA City Councilman Kevin DeLeon is here. And LA City Attorney Mike Fuhrer is here. Uh, I'm here, as I say. And the event is hosted by Democrats for the Protection of Animals, the Michelson Found Animals uh, uh, Group, and the Michelson Center for Public Policy, Social Compassion and Legislation. Uh, Greater Los Angeles Animal Spay and Neuter Collaborative, all involved in helping to bring this together. Um, I'll, uh, I'll introduce Jim, I'll have some uh, additional remarks in a second, but I do wanna try to keep it moving. So in that spirit, uh, Jim Jensfold is the president of uh, Democrats for the Protection of Animals and Jim, the floor is yours, go ahead. Okay, I'm up in the, I'm, I'm raising my hand. I'm Jim Jensfold, I'm the president of Democrats for the Protection of Animals and we're proud to co-host this mayoral forum. And we welcome the candidates, uh, Mr. DeLeon, Mr. Fuhrer, and all the attendees, and uh, all the people that are going, going to be watching uh, the recording of this, uh, of this forum later. Uh, Democrats for the Protection of Animals, our mission is to serve as a unified organization to promote the humane treatment of animals through education, advocacy, and legislation. And we hope that we can elevate uh, animal protection issues at the city, county, state, and, and even the federal level. So we, we really need uh, your help and we need your participation. And we invite anybody who's interested to join our organization. You can go to our website. We have a Facebook page. Or if you want more information from us, just write us at Dems for Animals, D-E-M-F-O-R Animals with an S at gmail.com. And now I'd like to turn it over to Vince Wong. He's the director of Collective Impact for the Michelson Found Animal Foundation. Well, thank you, Jim. How invigorating and what an exciting time for all of us to gather here this evening. Thank you, Councilmember De Leon. Thank you, City Attorney Mike Fuhrer uh, for joining us and for having this really important conversation. Uh, Jim, as you mentioned, Michelson Found Animals and the Michelson Center for Public Policy are super thrilled to be partners in this amazing conversation, this important conversation for animals uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, for us, we are a private foundation focused on saving pets and enriching lives at every point at which animals intersect our communities and our neighborhoods. Uh, we mul run multiple programs and do grant making here in Los Angeles. Super happy um, to, to have this conversation today. Uh, and uh, I'll keep it short and uh, introduce now Judy Mancuso, uh, who is not only a friend, but also the president and founder of Social Compassion and Legis Legislation. She also serves on the board of DPA and also is uh, the California Democratic Party endorsed candidate for Assembly District 72. Judy. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Vince. Hello and welcome to all our animal loving friends. I am so excited for this forum. It has been a long time coming for us to have animals on the agenda in the political arena. When I started working on animal issues decades ago, it was not easy to get our elected officials to pay attention to animal rights or animal welfare. Thankfully, we broke through and many of our elected officials in Los Angeles have given animals the top priority they deserve and have made Los Angeles a world leader in the animal rights movement. I began my political crusade for animals in 2006, right in LA. I know firsthand that the progress we made in LA served as a stepping stone for laws we passed in Sacramento and beyond. My group, Social Compassion and Legislation, has sponsored over 50 bills and has gotten 19 signed into law. And we have always had the support of the city behind us. So with that, I wanna to thank tonight's host, Democrats for the Protection of Animals, 
Along with the other sponsoring organizations, Michelson Found Animals and the Animal Spay and Neuter Collaborative, and a very special thanks to our friend Mark Thompson for being our moderator and being a voice for the animals in his job as a journalist and radio host with shows in San Francisco and Los Angeles on KGO and KFI and who has been a fellow vegan for the last eight years. I wanna thank the candidates, Kevin DeLeon and Mike Fuhrer for being here tonight. And of course, all of you in the audience, we know you are here because you are compassionate and fight for animals every day. Thank you all so much. And Mark, back to you. Thanks a lot, Judy. You're so passionate and so terrific in, in the work you do. And I've got to say, guys, I, I uh, you too, uh, Councilman De Leon and uh, City Attorney Mike Fuhrer, I, I'm, I'm really happy that you took the time to be part of this, but I'm also wanting to bring people's attention to the fact that you are a friend to animals on some level already. I mean, I think it speaks to that fact that, that you're here, okay? That's, I guess, what I'm saying. But it, you also, within the crafting of legislation and policy within uh, within the work you do, you know what it takes to reach across the uh, the world of those who may not see uh, the plight of animals to try to protect animals in the small ways and the big ways. So we'd love to have this conversation with you. It'll be just that, a conversation. We'll try to limit the responses to about a minute, and that way we, everybody can you know get out and in the time frame that they need to, but also it'll allow for a, sort of a, a, a back and forth within that time frame. I'm curious, uh, you know, as I say, you're both, uh, and I was just talking to some of those who are involved in, in this Zoom conversation about this fact, you're both uh, friends again, as I say, to causes associated with animals. I'm curious about your uh, personal histories. Um, Councilman De Leon, do you, you have a, or have you had dogs, cats, or other animals in your, in your personal history growing up or now? I do actually. I have uh, I have whiskey. It's being a little shy right now, as you can see right here. Uh, whiskey uh, as a rescue, uh, part Chihuahua, uh, as well as um, uh, Terrier. I'm trying to figure out his uh, his DNA, but uh, he's a great dog, loyal dog. Um, growing up as a child, I can't say I had one because we were always housing insecure, so we always had some challenges with. Uh, uh, landlords, you know, um, not allowing us to, to have pets. But today, you know, interestingly, as a as a council member and, and running for mayor, now I have one. So each time after some long debate or from live on television with Mike and other folks, you know, I have to run back to the house real quickly and, and take them out and go for a long walk every single night. So it's kind of giving me actually a little discipline, believe it or not, you know, uh, having whiskey. So this is whiskey right here. Oh, that's great. <laughs> It's hard not to love a guy who is uh, who's a dog lover. So uh, how about you, Mike? What's your contact and your interaction through your your growing up and today? So I've never had uh, uh, an animal in our house. You know, it was uh, I, I will say as an adult, the challenge has been that I want to be able to give the care and support and compassion that this companion would need. And I just haven't had the ability to do that given my time and my schedule. But as you know, I, I, I see Judy's getting a lot of affection as we speak. Um, and as you know, I'm very proud of my history of leadership as a policy matter because of my affinity for animals, um, which goes back, as you know, to my days on the city council when I was the lead author of a ballot measure that dramatically expanded the shelter system in Los Angeles. So don't have that personal history of actually having a companion in my house, but nonetheless have a long history of being extremely supportive and friendly to causes that you all care about very much. And I've been delighted to be a partner. I think Judy and I started in, in the Sacramento at the same time Judy started in her role. So we go back a long time. Indeed, uh, you know, your history, as I say, uh, is, uh, is a distinguished one as far as uh, as crafting a legislation that really makes a difference to animals. So that's uh, that's really cool that you mentioned. I, I'm gonna get back to something that uh, Councilman De Leon mentioned in a second, but uh, which is a, about housing insecurity and as it relates to animals. But uh, we'll start with the Department of Animal Services. 
a few months ago, the Department of Animal Services general manager shifted to a new role in the city. And because of that, LA Animal Services does not have a permanent general manager in place. So uh, if you're elected, what would you be looking for when interviewing a candidate for that job? And would that be a nationwide search or would you hire from within uh, LA? Uh, I, I guess I'll start with uh, with uh, Kevin DeLeon. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Mark. Listen, there's roughly 3 million privately owned pets in Los Angeles and likely tens of thousands of, of more, it, quite frankly, strays living on our streets today as one of the millions who are lucky enough to, 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 to be a guardian to an animal, you know, my dog in this case, Whiskey, so you all saw the fate of these animals to me is very personal. As mayor, I will immediately appoint a new general manager of the Department of Animal Services, someone who shares my vision, you know, and I think our vision collectively for a no-kill city where we actually can shelter our pets and don't slay our, our, them for, for termination. That's why I think that we talk about LAX, we talk about Harbor, you know, the ports of LA, we talk about LAPD, you know, chief, fire, you know, department chief, you know, our, our, our you know, animal shelter, uh, general manager is just as important. And we have to give it the equal weight that it deserves. We can't give it short shrift uh, because it's animals. We know for us, it, it's something that's deeply personal. And it's something that I, it's, that's very, very personal to me. Mike Fuhr, how about you? What would that search look like and what would your goal Thanks. be? Thanks, Mark. For one thing, I think this is a search that should be a national search. And my search is going to be for someone who will be a partner with me in advancing humane causes in specific ways. Uh, you know, we've, we have lost the 90% no kill mark. We're a little bit short of that. As I mentioned, one of the key reasons, the key reason I was the lead sponsor of the measure that expanded our shelter network was to achieve that objective. I want someone who shares that goal with passion. I want someone who has experience in advancing spay and neuter I, in creative ways, not just in the traditional approaches we've taken. I want someone who's terrific at assimilating not just staff, but volunteers into our shelter system. I've seen the rewards that volunteers feel from that experience and how they transmit their enthusiasm to members of the public who come in. I want someone who's gonna be a partner and focusing also, not just on appropriate care in our shelter system, but also fighting abuse and neglect in the community. As city attorney, you're probably well aware of the many cases we have brought, which I've done in very conspicuous ways on purpose to focus on the unlawful practice of veterinary medicine or puppy scams or uh, abusive uh, treatment of exotic animals or abuse and, nourish, uh, and malnourishment of pets or a whole array of other cases we have brought that have really laid down a marker that Los Angeles needs to be a place where we not only have these affirmative aspirations, but where we aggressively go after those who would abuse our animals in our community, uh, who would take advantage of people uh, in a way that would lead to the, to the detriment of their companion animals. So I want a leader who's gonna hit on all of these cylinders and more. The last thing I wanna say, Mark, is I want somebody who has deep experience with the broad cross-section of people in the humane community. As we know, there are sometimes disagreements among those who advocate for the rights of animals. And I want somebody who is skilled in mediating those disputes and finding common ground because one of the things that I have found over the course of my career that can impede progress for animals <laughs> is when there are those disagreements with the community. I've seen that on, on you know, TNR and for example, there have been other instances where we have to try to find ways to get back to some unified approach. It's a great question, thank you. And I think you're right to point to the fact that there's a disparate community within the community of those who, who love animals and want to see to it uh, that they are protected. And uh, one of your jobs, both of you, uh, is to somehow uh, address uh, all the different uh, uh, members of that community as best you can. And by the way, many members of that community will be seeing the recorded conversation that we're having now. So this conversation we're having will be blasted out. So thank you again both for, for being here. The LA Animal Services budget for the six shelter location is roughly 25 million. The department is, as you know, understaffed because of budget constraints and pandemic related uh, early retirements. There's a, a tight budget, which is not allowing for filling all the necessary positions. So fully reopening the shelters 
after the pandemic has been uh, difficult. And the public only has regular access to shelters on weekends, appointments required on weekdays. It's been, as you're well aware, both of you, um, a, a difficult period. Given all of these demands being placed on the city budget right now, uh, what will you do to address the pandemic-related reductions in staff and fully reopen the shelters without appointments, essentially the way it was pre-COVID? We'll start. go back to Kevin now. Sorry, hi, Kevin. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, let me say there's no doubt that our shelter system needs more resources in order to make us truly a no-kill city. And as mayor, I will advocate during our budget process to better fund our, our city's shelters. This is a, a, a also a great opportunity I want to score to, to connect young people and people who lost their jobs during the pandemic to refill those positions already uh, in, in our budget. But what that were lost, obviously, due, during uh, early retirements, because of early retirements during COVID-19, the truth is that we're at a place in Los Angeles where the budget is already cut to the bone. So in order to better help animals, our pets, we will have to get a lot more creative. Now we'll work with nonprofit for Wednesday three shelters uh, to help serve as a backstop as we work towards better funding our city shelters. And already in my council office, for example, we're working with local veterinarians to provide free vaccinations, microchipping and, and grooming you know, to local residents uh, with area pet wellness you know, uh, days like we are hosting you know, in, in Bull Heights, uh, right on the corner of uh, First and uh, Chicago. Uh, in, in Ball Heights, uh, we're gonna have a pet wellness day. In fact, I think with the, the Gary Michelson you know, Foundation uh, who's been so generous to, 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 to assist us, but this is really critical in how we become much more creative given our budget. And I wanna put this in context because I like the federal government uh, where they have a printing press, you know, it's called the US Treasury Department where they can run ongoing debt. And these state capital, both uh, Mike and I are, are originally from, uh, from the state cap up in Sacramento where they have capital gains taxes. We don't have that capability uh, in local government in, in Los Angeles. We remind on three major pillars, uh, which are property taxes. Uh, it's also uh, small business taxes, business taxes in, in general, but you know, mostly driven by restaurants as well as bars and hospitality. We know two out of three uh, were eviscerated because of COVID-19. So we're right now to the boat, which means we have to be much more creative, but it also has to be driven by our priorities you know, as a city with regards to our animals, you know, that are, uh, that, that should be cared to love for in the great city of Los Angeles. How about you, Mike? What, what would you do to try, as Kevin has noted, on a, on a budget that has a tremendous constriction associated with it and pressure on it, what would you do to try to get us back to sort of a pre-COVID life when it comes to uh, the shelters as they operate and services as, it operate, as they operate within LA? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I alluded a little bit earlier to something. Let me let me expand on a little bit. You know, I'm the one candidate for mayor who's actually been in charge of the budget for the city council, which I did um, in the 1990s. And again, where I focused on expanding the shelter network. I know that there are going to be many calls on the budget. And this is one of the areas in the delivery of city services where there's a big opportunity for a mayor who is creative and aggressive to engage the private sector. Because as many of you, I reckon a number of you on this call know, there is a tremendous pent up interest in the private sector in partnering with private philanthropy and partnering with an animal services system that they believe in. And so as mayor, in addition to prioritizing animal services as a key facet of public safety, which it is, I would engage the private sector to join us with philanthropic contributions designed to enhance and support what we have in the city. We're gonna to have to rely on reprioritizing some basic services in the city in order to assure that animal services has the budget that it needs. And I'll be a strong advocate for doing that. But there is gonna be a gap, I think, and that gap's gonna be filled by private philanthropy volunteers and others, which is very deeply tied, Mark, to your first question, which is the search for a new general manager. That general manager has to be someone who is prepared and capable of inspiring and engaging the broader community. Yeah, a link to the private sector. That's an interesting uh, notion. Uh, you know, you referenced this before uh, in this conversation, uh, you two, the, uh, the accepted definition of no kill is a 90% live release rate. Um, 
that's a commitment uh, the commitment that the city made several years ago as you're aware uh, the last three mayors have moved LA a long way toward being a no-kill city and we've been on the verge for the last several years but there's still uh, potentially adoptable animals entering the shelters who end up being euthanized because of uh, several factors and this I alluded to before you know uh, one of the factors is uh, uh, not enough people adopting, but also places for uh, people to live where pets are allowed. That's the thing that we kind of touched on before a and or rescue organizations with the capacity to take more animals. So against that backdrop, uh, what is your vision for making LA truly a, a, a no kill city if elected? What might you do to uh, take on this issue and actually get us across the finish line? Let's go back to you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, listen, a, a no kill has to be our goal. And as I said, uh, the issue is always the question of funding. While we are working to, to solve the revenue end of this, we can and should be partnering with local nonprofits to, to find fosters for, for difficult placements. Uh, I also favor programs like, like Feral Freedom, which has been used, I think, very successfully in San Jose as a model, the type of the trap, neuter, and, and return, the, the TNR that we should be doing, you know, the spay and, and neuter. I think that it's really, really critical, you know, for us here. But l let me say this, um, because also to uh, having experience with the budget is going to be very, very critical. And I'm the only candidate uh, who's running for mayor who actually has experience of negotiating uh, a $200 billion you know, budget, now, not a 10 uh, or $11.8 billion budget, but actually $200 billion budget in that leading on the negotiations as one of three individuals, the governor, the speaker, myself, who lead these negotiations, who get the final deal and deal with the complexities and you know, have our values that are driven to make sure our priorities are reflected uh, in the budget, even during very, very difficult times. Uh, so that's why when we talk about where we're at 90%, we've dipped under that 90%. We want to get to our 100% you know, uh, a goal, we are going to have to be creative, we're going to have to be utilizing, working with nonprofit organizations and philanthropy, uh, but we also, it's part our priority of who we are as a great city to make sure that we fund our priorities in a city like Los Angeles, where 4 million plus, we got about 3 million, you know, pets, you know, and again, that doesn't count the thousands more that are out there on the streets, you know, uh, uh, and and um, it, it, we've got to really drive this once and for all to make sure. And, and with, with Judy, and then let me underscore one thing too, what I should have said a little earlier. So the major, major, you know, uh, uh, pet legislation, animal rights legislation that, I apologize, I had a phone call coming in and it comes in, you know, uh, uh, through my phone, through the iPad. Um, some of the biggest, most landmark, pieces of legislation with regards to, you know, animal rights, you know, working with Judy would never have gone past, you know, the finish line uh, if I did not personally intervene and make sure it actually crossed the finish line. So I've not just been a good vote, you know, for uh, animal rights, but actually led on the issue of animal rights using power and leaning in to make sure that it actually comes to fruition. Good stuff. I, um, I'm being told uh, to uh, try to, uh, move you both along, which I hate to do because I think you're both saying such important things, uh, but uh, I know you have a hard out times, et cetera. So if you can, the closest you can come to a minute in response would be great. As I say, I, I hate to say that because I think both of you have been terrific thus far. Um, how about you, Mike Fuhrer? Uh, what about uh, getting us across that finish line of, of a no-kill city? Yeah, so I think, thank you, Mark, and, and, and thanks for making me the first test of whether we can stay in a minute or not. <laughs> so, um, but let me, let me begin by saying uh, there are several elements to no kill. There's having adequate staffing in shelters. There's inspiring adoption throughout the wider community and making it easier for that to happen. And there's also a deep link to an assertive and effective spay and neuter program. So uh, that, that combination of factors will be my touchstone in how we get to 90 plus percent. Now, to get there is gonna require, we said earlier, some budgetary priority shifting. It's gonna require that private sector role that I described earlier. It is also, however, gonna require some other unusual factors. For example, being creative about how we publicize getting the word out to community members about the possibility of adopting um, through the shelter system. 
and about the imperative to do that as opposed to going through breeding, for example. And I think we can, as a city, have an effective public relations campaign using public service announcements with our media outlets here that would enhance our capacity to inspire people to participate in that process, even as we're furthering spay and neuter, even as we're budgeting so we have staff that's actually available. I'm glad you mentioned spay and neuter. Hold uh, whatever additional stuff you wanted to mention there because I'm gonna follow up here with this uh, spay and neuter issue, which as you know, is critical to controlling the, uh, the animal population. We'll include TNR in that. Uh, city residents, as you're both aware, have access to spay and neuter vouchers. That, uh, the spay and neuter organizations and animal guardians uh, depend on these, on these vouchers and these organizations. And this will be crucial to supporting the new citywide cat program and trap neuter release program. Both of you have uh, referenced that. Funding for vouchers is about half of what it was before the, uh, the recession back in 2009. That when that when the demand, of course, is uh, is greater than ever. So, in the last two years, spay and neuter funds have been used to pay uh, shelter veterinary staff, and now with the city cat program getting into gear, the spay and neuter budget should be double what it was in '09, uh, not half that budget. So, uh, again, uh, it's a challenging backdrop, but nonetheless, it's the backdrop we have. If elected, would you make spay and neuter funding a priority? And if so, how could you make it more accessible and affordable in the city of LA? Let's go back to you, uh, Councilman DeLeon. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark. There's no uh, argument that the budget should be larger, much larger. And I will increase that budget if, if revenue allows. As you know, we're coming out of a once in a generation pandemic to deal with a once in a ger generation homelessness crisis. We have lost uh, a major amount of revenue at the same time when we need the revenue the most. Um, like I said, I favor programs like Feral Freedom, which have been very used very successfully in San Jose, again, you know, as a model with our, our TNR uh, that we should be doing. Um, but we're gonna have to be creative. And that means really engaging the private sector to really step up to provide, you know, that, that, that differential subsidy, uh, especially for uh, neighborhoods uh, that have been really devastated and are of low income means, which would be very critical if we're gonna be successful during a period where we need it the most, but our revenues are much more challenged uh, during a, a global pandemic. Uh, thanks. Look, I, I know that this is a time during which uh, everybody's saying we need money and we need money. But uh, now, Mike Fuhrer, uh, what do you do to, uh, for a program that is that has been starved of a lot of the funding? Well, there's no magic to this, and it kind of relates to every other issue we've discussed. Um, each of the issues we've raised so far implicates the need for additional resources. And I pretty much said earlier the kinds of approaches that I would take, and it pertains particularly to the spay and neuter program. The voucher system, the voucher program, the budget, I think, is about the same as it was 13 years ago. Um, and the needs, of course, are much greater. And the TNR program is going to make it even more intense. So this is going to require not only some reprioritizing of budget resources, but this is, and again, the, the theme that is important, getting folks to agree that a community-wide effort to make spay and neuter more affordable is going to be imperative. And I don't know how else to do that besides focusing on philanthropic, nonprofit, and private resources to supplement the city's role in this regard. Because in addition to, you know, we're going to have to find resources to keep the shelters open, to obviate the need for the very limited appointment times, to grapple with the other issues that we've discussed so far. And so we're going to have to find a way to cobble together an array of resources to make it happen. And I'm going to do that. Uh, thank you both. Thank you both uh, for adhering to uh, the time as best you're able. Mm -hmm. Topic three, quickly, we'll move on to accessible, yeah. affordable pet resources to underserved communities. And uh, there are an increasing number of under-resourced and underserved communities, as you're well aware, not enough low-cost and free uh, resources like uh, spay and neuter services, which we've talked a lot about. Uh, even pet pantries, kitten and shelter intervention programs, uh, programs accessible uh, to all of these different uh, uh, communities that don't have transportation, you know, even just a few miles away can be prohibitive as you're both aware. So what will you do to increase resources? And you, know, you both, I think, have spoken of inventive ways maybe to reach out and make services like veterinary care, vaccination, spay and neuter accessible to seniors, to uh, low income families and to those who may just really lack transportation. 
I'll go back to, I'm sorry, it's, Kevin. Thanks, Haley, Mark. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, no, thank you, thank you much, Mark. And obviously, it's a very critical uh, uh, question. We, we all love our pets, regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of who you love, regardless of which zip code, whether you're living in Encino or East LA, whether you live in Sherman Oaks or South LA, whether you live in Watts or Woodland Hills or Westchester. And this is something that is, as we all know, you know, it, not equitable. Uh, with regard to who gets access to chipping, who gets access to, you know, uh, uh, spaying and, and, and neutering, you know, who gets access to vaccinations and, 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 and all the sort, even when it comes to licensing, you know, some, a lot of folks do it, a lot of folks don't do it as well too, you know, and traveling around the city, just like my cast, you know, campaigning, you know, we're in neighborhoods, you know, where we see a lot of, you know, uh, uh, folks, a lot of our animals that we love dearly, just roaming the street. You know, there was one community that there was just packs of dogs running all over the street. And it didn't look like this was Los Angeles, California, or even the United States of America, you know, but they're folks who love their pets. So we have to be very intentional. We have to be very pur purposeful in terms of the equitable distribution as well too. And who's getting access and who's not. I can tell you this, you know, in neighborhoods that I represent, such as Boyle Heights, that was at the height of the pandemic, uh, 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 we were ground zero for both infections as well as mortality rates and the comfort of our own pets, you know, was very critical for our own mental health, you know, uh, for our own uh, psychotherapy, if you will. You know, many folks may have access because they have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you know, health nets, you know, uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente. I can tell you this, a lot of folks who I represent, and folks very similar throughout the city, don't have access. So our pets are actually our own psychotherapy, if you will. Absolutely They're right. I've got to call you, uh, 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 wrap you up here, Kevin. I'm so uh, sorry. Okay. Well, that, no, no, but I, I, I think you make a very important point about the, and, and that's why it's so critical. It'll come up again in just a moment, but now to a city attorney, Mike Fjord. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks very much, Mark. So this goes, this question goes to my whole approach to governing and organizing the mayor's office. I'm going to organize the mayor's office, not in silos, but rather around issues. So we tether together departments that often work in fragmented ways. And let's talk about how that applies to this issue. So let's talk about seniors, for example. We have a Department of Aging. The Department of Aging and Departmental Services, as far as I know, have never worked together. But aging has programs in senior citizen centers throughout the city of Los Angeles. And we need to be working together to maximize their outreach to the seniors who come into their facilities to focus on the issues you've described because many seniors are underserved when it comes to this issue. We talk about kids and they're a great vehicle to deal with their parents. On gun violence, I worked with the LAUSD to be sure that parents were apprised of their responsibilities to safely store guns. We can work city LAUSD together to have kids inform parents about the availability and the imperative of spay and neuter, for example, when there is an animal companion in the home. Um, in terms of actually reaching physically the communities we're talking about, that's where mobile outreach becomes incredibly important. And the city has previously used mobile outreach to, to grapple with the issue that you've described, which is a lack of physical access to the facilities that we're talking about. So these are, I, I know all ingredients together, all of them require that creativity and that cross-jurisdictional collaboration that I want to inspire in City Hall. Uh, and now to pets and housing. Both of you have alluded to this problem in uh, one way or another. It's increasingly difficult for animal parents to secure pet inclusive uh, rental housing. I mean, and this is in a, uh, at a time when already rental housing can be tough enough. But they uh, conducted uh, a national survey. Uh, the Michelson uh, Found Animals Foundation did in human animal bond research. It's 72% of residents reported that pet friendly housing is hard to find. So not being able to keep a pet in a rental unit is one of the top reasons families actually surrender their pets uh, to animal shelters. A quarter of the residents say that their pets have been a reason for them needing to move. Again, now both of you understand the compelling uh, nature of having a member of the family like your pet with you. But even when pets are allowed, in 92% of the cases, there exist breed and size limitations and or heavy pet deposits. So it gets harder and harder to keep that pet on board with the family. Uh, given the increased housing insecurity, as I mentioned, and for LA residents, what is your position on breed and size restrictions? I know this gets a little bit into the weeds and we've only given you a minute to answer, but uh, when it comes to rental housing, especially in public housing, 
where the choices might be limited. Maybe you can speak to that. And additionally, maybe if you, there's time, what is your position on pet rents and, and deposits? So as best you can, Kevin de Leon, let's go back to you and address maybe some of these issues as best you can, as I say, in the limited time. Thank you so very much. I'll, I'll do the best of my ability given the, the, the short period of time. We have to change culture within the city of LA. We have 4 million residents. We have 3 million pets out there that we know of. And the reality is this, is that uh, pet adoptions grew exponentially during the global pandemic. So now what are we gonna do now with, especially with eviction moratoriums are looming on the horizon. Uh, and now with a culture that is, have so many landlords wired, not all, but so many landlords wired to be anti-pet. These are part of our, our family, they're our family members. They are our companions. And we have to do a lot of educational outreach, you know, and, and working with organizations such as AGLA, uh, the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, who I have very good relationships with. We've got to work with our landlords and we have to really emphasize and change culture that pets are an extended member of our family. And oftentimes when folks lose their pets, you know, they give up their pets precisely because of landlords. But, you know, I'm not waiting to be have a fancy title of mayor to lead on this issue because I'm leading right now. I built the largest tiny home village in the United States of America. Uh, I did it in three months. It's right off the 110 freeway, Road Seco. It is for our unhoused neighbors. Guess what? You can bring your pets. Your pets are welcome. You know, so if you've been experiencing homelessness and one of the reasons why you've never wanted to go to a non congregate short-term you know, uh, shelter is because uh, they won't allow pets. Your pets are welcome in CD14. Even when it comes to home key, room key uh, at the, the hotels, your pets are welcome. They will always be welcome because they're your companion. And, and that is the, 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 the bond, you know, the, 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 the glue that brings families together, whether you're housed or unhoused. We have to change culture and do a lot of education with our landlords. Uh, well done. To keep it to more or less to time. Thank you, Councilman De Leon. More or less, now, I guess I, I wasn't a passing grade. So I well, thought it was it was good enough to uh, yeah. to note it as a positive. Uh, now to City Attorney Mike Fuhrer. Uh, again, Mike, so many challenges in this way. Uh, what might be done to um, make uh, make these situations uh, that require uh, uh, some outreach uh, work in terms of housing uh, with for those with people with pets and and people who have uh, strong associations to their animals. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So let's talk about a couple of different populations first. Let's talk about people experiencing homelessness and then more broadly, the general population. When it comes to people experiencing homelessness, as we know, one of the major impediments to people wanting to enter a temporary or permanent shelter or housing is the inability of those locations to accommodate pets. And that needs to be different. That needs to change. We've seen success in the city generally when we've relaxed rules around that issue at Bridge Homes, for example. And I wanna as mayor be sure to encourage the continuation of those approaches because it makes a big difference. Now, with regard to the general population, it's a harder question to answer because we're not, we're not gonna pass an ordinance in the city that requires the landlord to allow any pet that somebody wishes to bring in. Um, that's gonna be a real challenge for us to grapple with. The only way that I can imagine grappling with that question in a practical way is to educate the broader community of landlords um, about value that someone who comes with a pet can add to that unit. Because while it may be true that, that landlords are concerned about issues that might relate to you know, staining carpets or in other ways, making it more complicated to have a clean apartment, on their hand, what you're getting with that tenant is a stable tenant who is likely to want to create a space for their companion that is safe and secure and landlords want that stability. So I think that there are different approaches to take depending upon the population we're talking about. At the end of the day, it's mostly an educational function with regards to landlords. The uh, emergency tenant protections that are um, right now ensuring that tenants uh, are not evicted for their pets, this is gonna expire soon. What plans might there be to ensure that tenants with pets are, are not targeted uh, and evicted? Um, after the tenant protections expire. Let's go back to Kevin De Leon. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Mark. And they're about to expire. And one of the things that we should always, you know, you as, you know, should never, as a tenant, should never be in a position uh, to choose between having a roof over your head and your pet that you love so dearly, who's part of your family. Be very clear. So we have to extend those protections, number one. Uh, because no one should ever have, bottom line, ever have to be in a position to choose either keeping a roof over your head 
or uh, in fact, you know, uh, losing their pet or, you know, worse, getting evicted because of, of, of the pet, the, the, the animal that you love so dearly. So we need to extend those uh, 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 extensions, those, uh, I should say, uh, the moratorium. And, uh, and Mike Fuhrer? Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very quickly, I'm, I'm hopeful that we, even after the eviction moratorium expires, that we can have in place in the city of Los Angeles rules that say that the fact that a tenant has an animal is not in itself a ground for eviction. That would be a step forward. Uh, our fifth topic is animals uh, in entertainment and amusement. Uh, LA has led the way, as you're well aware, in reducing how animals are exploited in entertainment, the banning of bull hooks, uh, the painful tool that's used to control uh, elephants in, in circuses, uh, a precursor to California banning wild animals in circuses statewide, I should add. Uh, Angelinos have continually raised their voices about other animals in entertainment. Um, uh, rodeos and, uh, and the continued isolation of Billy the Elephant at the LA Zoo. Uh, tell us about your stance on animals in entertainment. Uh, do you believe in regulation that is that regulation can adequately uh, control these environments and prevent harm to animals and entertainment? Or do you think that ending animals and entertainment is the only way to prevent uh, harm to these animals? We'll go back to you, Kevin. Oh, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, listen, we, we grew up um, seeing animals and viewing animals as, as, as entertainment. Uh, now we know better. Um, who didn't go to SeaWorld, who didn't go to circus, I mean, who wasn't excited to go to circus. We didn't, we view it through, we saw it through a, a very di different prism. Now we know clearly, you know, animals should never be used as, you know, entertainment uh, for human entertainment or for human pleasure to be commoditized, to be monetized, you know, uh, and a profit be extracted, you know, if given an opportunity the honor to lead this great city to be your next mayor, Seattle Sanders. I'll continue to lead on this issue. Um, I think uh, a leader, you know, in the council, you know, no doubt has, has been Paul Koretz. He's done some incredible stuff. You know, I will lead, continue to lead on this issue because regulations will take you, so, you, know, you know, so far, statutory, you know, uh, uh, laws will take you so far. You know, Mike and I, you know, at one time, Mike and I, you know, we were policymakers, we made laws, you know, people break laws, they follow laws or they outright ignore the laws, you know, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's how you change culture. And if you have to just outlaw it altogether, you know, and that's the pathway we need to do to stop commoditizing, you know, the profit and the entertainment of animals who are live beings, you know, and so be it. Uh, Mike Fuhrer, how about you? Regulation enough or does more have to be done? Well, a couple thoughts. First of all, again, as city attorney, I've been very proud of our leadership when it comes to situations in which exotic animals in particular are used for entertainment, not just in the traditional ways we're talking about, but also on the internet. As you know, we famously prosecuted a guy who was in a possession of a tiger cub and allegedly mistreated that tiger cub and made sure that as part of the resolution of that case, that the tire club was transferred to a wildlife sanctuary. Um, and that typifies the approach I wanna take. You know, when it comes to entertainment broadly, I wanna identify some different categories here. When we talk about the entertainment industry itself and the use of animals in the film, in filming, for example, the use of, of dogs or cats, for example, in movies. Um, I do not think that outlawing that use is necessary. I think that regulation is very important with on-site monitors to assure that the treatment is humane and appropriate. Um, I think that that kind of regulation is consistent with all of our values. Um, at the same time, I'm as a strong supporter of the idea that we shouldn't be perpetuating the old approach to having circuses use wild animals, for example. Um, that was an important regulation. So I'm marking it depends on the nature of the entertainment we're talking about. On the internet, I think that exploiting animals, especially exotic animals for the uh, entertainment of the person on, on, in TikTok um, needs to be clamped down on. I've done it as city attorney. Um, when it comes to the film I've industry- gotta, I've got to wrap oh, you sorry. up, Mike. I'm sorry. Sure. I, I, okay. I, again, That's I think cool. the point about specifics is a very uh, a good one. Uh, uh, one more question, and I'll uh, time for a couple of quick remarks from both of you, and then we're so grateful for you taking time and really having the interest uh, uh, tonight. Um, 
wildlife habitats, conservation versus restoration. So I'll ask you this one question just as a, uh, uh, but, but this is kind of the backdrop. I mean, look, we're a park poor city, um, yet there are biodiversity hotspots, as you know, um, you know, uh, flora and fauna that exist nowhere else on earth. Wildlife habitats like the LA River, Sepulveda Basin, Bird Sanctuary, the Santa Monica Mountains, the Bologna uh, uh, Wetlands Creek. They've uh, decade long battles between, as you're aware, public recreation development rights and community activism. And uh, there's so many interests that have to be balanced there to protect and restore the city's remaining critical wildlife habitats. Um, everyone who's tuning in on this call and will see this recording, uh, we all have an interest in protecting these, uh, these endangered areas. So uh, what is your position on the planned restorations in, in places like the Bologna wetlands and, and what should be done to preserve and, and, and perhaps to uh, uh, protect these habitats and wild creatures? That's what we're really, that's how it relates to animals. Uh, in terms of future plans under uh, may, your mayoral guidance? We'll go back to Kevin. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. That, that is a very important question. And I do uh, support 100% the restoration of our natural flora, our natural habitats, such, such as Bayona. Um, let me be very clear on this issue. No elected official in the city's history has created more parks, a green space than I have in the city of LA. In fact, I've created 22 parks. Uh, my name may not be in the parks right there, but I've created 22 parks. First bill ever introduced uh, uh, as a legislator was AB 31. It was appropriation of $400 million uh, for the creation of parks. And I'm also the author of uh, Proposition 68, which is my Senate Bill 5. That's $800 million for more parks and open space uh, statewide, but a good chunk of that change will be coming here. So having green grass grow underneath our feet and having green grass for our furry friends to, to roam all over is absolutely critical for me. And you're absolutely right, Mark. This has been a park star community city. Concrete, cement, asphalt. You know, for whatever reasons, politicians of the past in the city council, as well as previous mayors, as well as planning commissioners, as well as very powerful non-elected officials made decisions that have impacted our community, have impacted, you know, our furry friends. They decided that we want to build strip malls. They decided that we want to build cement. We want to pour cement, concrete, and asphalt, have no trees for canopy, you know, so we can you know, decreased the, the hot, hellacious, you know, temperatures right now. And if we want a community where we can allow our, our children as well as our furry friends to have green grass grow beneath their feet, we have to do this with a sense of intentionality and a sense of purpose because the free market forces don't allow it. And when we, I have, for example, nine major freeways to crisscross my district, like a serpent that chokes there out of a young girl's lawns. I have the two, the five, the 10, the 60, one, 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 mm -hmm. 10, 134, the 210 and the 710. Imagine if we didn't have all those freeways, we had more open space, you know, for natural flora. Uh, we have to protect what we have, but we have an opportunity, which is really critical, to reverse decades, decades of absolute utter political neglect from political officials throughout the city and the region of LA. That's why I've always been a big, huge park uh, champion, and I will be for our children, for our senior citizens, and for today's purposes, for all our little furry friends who deserve access to open space. How about you, Mike Fuhrer? Yeah, so Mark, let's talk about the question. The question was how to balance some conflicting objectives. And I'm gonna to try to find ways as mayor to not only not to cut through the false choices inherent in the question. So for example, I was just in the Sepulveda Basin, for instance, it is completely compatible to have passive recreation, you know, right. uh, trails and so forth yeah. and wildlife restoration and assuring biodiversity in the basin. Um, I, I saw it firsthand. And that kind of approach we need to take to other locations as well. As we talk about the LA River and restoration of the LA River, we have to be identifying that biodiversity as a fundamental objective and compatible with the passive or a bike path, for example. Um, in South Los Angeles, as you know, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy uh, partnered with the community and created the first um, uh, wetland in South LA to educate the community, but it also creates in addition to that educational opportunity and recreational opportunity and the beauty of the location. It also creates another opportunity to enhance the biodiversity in that location. So as mayor, I'm gonna find ways to say on the one hand, development in these locations needs to be stopped. That has been fundamental to me since I was on the city council and preserved Santa Monica Mountains territory from development. 
On the other hand, I think passive recreation combined with wildlife and biodiversity restoration are compatible objectives that I'll pursue as mayor in each of the locations we've discussed and beyond. That is all the time we have for questions. We'd love to hear just some uh, general comments as we wrap up. We'll go first to Kevin and then we'll go to you, Mike. And again, wanna thank you for your Thanks, time. Mark. Kevin, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark and Tom are good friends. On, on June 7th, in just a few months, you'll be asked to vote for the next mayor of Los Angeles. And the question is very simple and clear. What kind of city do we want? Do you want a Los Angeles that only works for the super wealthy and the elites? Or do you want a city where owning a pet is cost prohibitive? It might be the one thing that keeps you from signing a lease on the apartment that you want, or could be the reason you get evicted. Or do we want a city that works for people like us, working people, middle-class people, people who care deeply about the animals we live with, both at home and across the city. The issues of anim animal-friendly apartments, parks and green spaces, the cost of spaying and neutering, vaccination services, aren't just animal welfare issues. They're issues of affordability. They affect our unhoused neighbors. And if you're living on the edge, and you adopt a, a, a life companion, but your landlord doesn't like it, that could be the reason someone ends up on the street. It's wrong, and we know it. And we have a great deal of work to do in the city to make sure that we're living, that we're living actually in harmony with our, our four-legged friends. Me, let me say this, I'm a doer. When I say I'm gonna do something, I follow through. I believe in the power of this great city and what the city has to offer only with the right leadership. I believe that we can make Los Angeles a 100% no-kill city. And I believe we can make a more animal-friendly city from our apartment buildings to our shelters to our parks and beyond animal welfare. I believe that we can mandate affordable housing, protect good jobs with benefits and solve homelessness. And if you give me the honor of being your next mayor, I know that we can take on and we can overcome our greatest challenges together. Finally, let me say this, I've made California a 100% clean, renewable state the largest economy in the world to legally commit ourselves to decarbonizing our grid. I can make the city of Los Angeles a 100% kill-free zone if you give me that honor. I thank you very much. Councilman Kevin DeLeon, thank you so very much. And now City Attorney Mike Fuhrer, it's your opportunity to, as best you can, summarize uh, what you would look forward to in your mayoral administration as far as animal issues are concerned. Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you everybody, not just for participating today, but I know so many of you for your activism without which many of the changes we've been talking about today would never have been made. And I look forward to continuing our partnership when I'm mayor. The discussion today, you know, Mark, you wanted, you're saying let's focus on issues that are tied to what brings people together tonight around animals. Um, this is about core values and it's about translating those values into concrete action. And throughout my career, you have seen me do that on the issues you care about the most. I alluded to my leadership on the city council regarding the creation of additional um, uh, clinics throughout Los Angeles. So we had animal shelters that would enable us to get, get to a no kill level. But I also wanna emphasize that throughout my career, whether it was in Sacramento or as city attorney, the continued emphasis on educating the public about the values that we're talking about today and about doing so when people violate norms that would lead all of us to be horrified. And what do we do about standing up for animals who are in great need? Um, I want to say I'm the only candidate in this race who has executive leadership experience right here in Los Angeles. A lot of our discussion tonight has centered around previous legislative work. And Kevin and I have both been legislators. Kevin is now. That's a different role. As a legislator, you have to have an opinion and a vote, but as, but as an executive, as I've been a city attorney, you have to be able to set priorities and then direct staff to effectuate those priorities and hold people accountable with time frames and measures of success. Otherwise, someone else should be doing the job. That is what we need right now when it comes to animal protection in Los Angeles. That's what we need right now when it comes to the successor who to lead animal services and the partnership that person needs to have with the mayor of Los Angeles. Again, having the values is one thing, but having the pragmatic ability to implement those values, whether it comes to expanding spay and neuter notwithstanding budget constraints, 
or assuring staff is available so shelters are open at all hours and not just on limited periods of time on weekends that are on during the weekdays and so on. This is the work of a mayor. And when it comes to the broad array, array of issues that we've just begun to touch on tonight, from biodiversity to assuring that tenants have an opportunity to have a place to live with their companion, I have a record on each of these issues. And I look forward to building on it as your continued teammate when I'm mayor. There are so many other issues to discuss, right? Homelessness, affordable housing, public safety, recovery from the pandemic, environmental sustainability, all these issues. But tonight we had the chance to do something we have never done in this campaign. And that is to rivet ourselves on the issues that bring all of us together tonight. And I'm very glad we did. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, of course, City Attorney Mike Fuhrer. And, and I will say that in closing, I have immense respect for both of you, but I'm even more impressed tonight with both of you as you, you know this, uh, this area quite well. Some of you uh, uh, who are watching tonight know a specific part of this area so very well, and you may be frustrated, how come they didn't ask about this or that? Our limited time, uh, I think, gives you a sense of both of these people as it relates to the overall challenges that the city of LA faces regarding uh, animal uh, uh, rights and uh, animal issues and challenges in, in the most basic programs. So I, I hope we've touched on, and I think we have touched on, many of these issues that relate, as I say, to, to the overall question of how animals are treated in our community. I want to uh, mention again that this recording is going to be blasted out via email and through various websites, but uh, you can get it. And if you want it, it's uh, demsforanimals at gmail.com, and we'll send you a link, and you can send it out to others, Dems for F O R animals at gmail. Uh, dot com. Again, thanks to the Democrats for the protection thank of animals you, and you. all of you. Thank, and thank you, you everybody. Kevin, thanks very much. Yeah, Mike, Great to see thank you, you so thank much. You. Yeah. Good night.